1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered one of the most powerful oratories in American history. It was the climax of the historic March on Washington. But the day was much more than the I Have a Dream speech. For participants, including a group from Minnesota, the March on Washington was a monumental organizational achievement, a high point for the movement that led up to it, and an unforgettable moment of motivation for the bittersweet years that would follow. Minnesotans are also staunch supporters of three big annual shows, Winter Carnival. In 1958, Minnesota celebrated 100 years as a state. But more important than that... As part of the centennial, African-American journalist Carl Rowan was held up as a symbol of the strides blacks had made here. Minnesotans had made it obvious that racial injustice weighed heavily on the conscience of the people. In many state. ways, Rowan was right. Minnesota had made real progress toward equality and opportunity through the efforts of Minneapolis mayor and senator Hubert Humphrey, who worked closely with black activists like newspaper publisher Cecil Newman and labor leader Nellie Stone Johnson. The cities of this rich and lovely land are friendly cities. They gave me a ticket to Minneapolis, and that was February 1948. Matthew Little had come north to find a better life, but he soon found out that Minnesota had its own brand of Jim Crow. I heard that there were some openings for firefighters. And I said, boy, that would do, that I'd settle for that. Little, a college graduate and a physically fit Army vet, knew he had done well in the multi-part test. He even broke a record in the physical portion of the exam, but he couldn't outrun intolerance. They failed him. Matt Little confronted one of the testers. And I asked him, just how could you do that? The civil service tester admitted to the race-based projection of Little's application. This was one of dozens of indignities that he suffered in the Twin Cities. It made me become active in the civil rights uh, movement. Matt Little in Minnesota, Rosa Parks in Montgomery. By the mid-50s, blacks were fighting back. In the summer of 63, the growing movement had led to an emerging but vulnerable civil rights bill that was taking shape in Washington. To push for its passage, an array of activists and organizations called for the ultimate demonstration, a massive march on Washington. Matthew Little would become the chair of the Minnesota contingent. The national planners required that marchers represent a remarkable range of race, religion, region, and class. So each state had to pull together a surprisingly diverse group of participants. This was just one of the many challenges that had to be met, with the March date just weeks away. In the press, there was a lot of indication that you are able to get 250 civil rights people there. In Washington, there'd be all kinds of riots and everything else. Even Minnesota's progressive politicians had worries about the march. There was a lot of apprehension, but finally they all, uh, they came around. In addition to feeling a diverse group and cultivating political support, the participants also had to agree to the key strategy of the sit-ins and freedom rides, nonviolence. Some leaders in the local movement decided they couldn't promise total nonviolence, so they didn't go. The fact is, after years of direct action, activists had proven their commitment to peaceful protest. But Washington officials were still worried, so a tough requirement was placed on the event. One of the other requirements were that the whole 250, all the marches, would have to be out of Washington by sundown. Challenges were met, funds were raised, a million details were dealt with. Finally, Minnesota was ready to march. It's my regret that I didn't get to uh, go to the March on Washington. But after I got off from work that night, I thought, well, I'll drive out to the airport anyhow. We had the old airport then, and it had that open roof. And here down on the field was this little tiny plane. And I felt like it was just carrying all the hopes for the future. When the plane finally took off, we all just automatically reached out and took one another's hands, and we sang, We Shall Overcome. And it was just a really, really beautiful time.
The morning of August 28, 1963, Minnesota marchers reached D.C. When the Minnesotans reached the mall, they joined a quarter of a million like-minded Americans. Interestingly, there were Minnesotans on the other side of the stage as well. Roy Wilkins had gone from the St. Paul neighborhood of Rondo to the leadership of the National NAACP. He was among the organizers of the event. There was Whitney Young, a University of Minnesota graduate and executive director of the National Urban League, and Dr. Anna Arnold Hedgeman, a product of Anoka, Minnesota and Hamlin University. She was the lone woman among the national organizers. The day's program featured a progression of presenters representing the past and future of the movement. And then Dr. King got up, and it was um, this hush that just captured the entire 250,000 people. And boy, it was the most uh, captivating thing you've ever seen in your life. A picture that I, um, I'll always remember. It was so dramatic, and, and it had such meaning. It was so simple. The message was so simple, the dream that we all had. During their charter flight back to the Twin Cities, the Minnesotans were sky high. There was a microphone on the, uh, on the plane that they allowed me to use. And I asked if everybody feels like I do. And they say, yes, <laughs> you know, everybody, yes. So, well, this can't possibly be the end. The group formed the March on Washington Committee and successfully pressed every one of the state's elected officials to support the crucial civil rights legislation. In addition to national efforts, Minnesota's activists also made real change here at home. This button had been sold to raise money for the march and other civil rights causes. It became the symbol of the movement, a black and white beacon that simply and strikingly captured the mood of the March on Washington. Then in 1967, Dr. King came to the Twin Cities. King was now hearing the call of other causes like the Poor People's Campaign and the anti-war movement. And so this is where we are today, moving to a new phase of the struggle. I can remember grabbing a sweater, whatever, and dashing out there and uh, being so proud of him. The courage of the man could never be disputed, and I felt that that day. The speech included a familiar finish. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Thank you. A year later, King was killed. The fight would continue, sometimes in the street, but much of the esprit and essence of the civil rights movement died with King. And from all the points of the compass, we came to march. 35 Washington years after King appeared on campus, Concord, there was another Concord. eventful gathering at the university. Minnesotans who were a part of the March on Washington came together for a 40-year reunion. My name is Marge Wayne Turner. The march started in my living room after watching the water hoses and dogs on the TV every night. One evening I said to my husband, I had seen a little blurb in the paper about the march, and I said, I think we should go to that. He said, okay. Well, then I didn't know what to do from that. I called Dr. Tom Johnson, who lived across the alley from me. She said, I'll write a check for $6,000 to charter the plane, and you guys get the money together by Monday, because I got to cover the check. <laughs> <laughs> and by Sunday afternoon, we had $6,000 to pay for the plane. Well, I want to let you know, I have my canceled check <laughs> received of it. I wrote you the first bad check connected with it. And unfortunately, or fortunately, it did go through. Inspired by the March on Washington, I became the um, whip for the Democratic Study Group when the Civil Rights Bills came to the floor of the House of Representatives, and we kept track of everybody who walked down the aisle to cast their vote. That led, in a few years, to another reform to require that there be a recorded vote, and that changed the whole process of the United States Congress. To me, the whole civil rights struggle is the emblem of the America that I 
think about when I'm proud to be an American. I'd like to share with you how the March on Washington influenced my children. Some years ago, when they called me downstairs one night to tell me how I had influenced their lives. Now, let me tell you something. If your kids do that for you before you kick off, <laughs> you have received a wonderful blessing. I when we got down to Washington, the thing that really surprised me and, and just left me in tears from the moment that we stepped out to do the march was the constant singing of We Shall Overcome. And we we're all holding hands. We need to re-engage ourselves and recommit ourselves to what is right and just. When you stand for something, you have to be consistent committed and determined, and we are not finished yet.